By 2020, Figma software for UI UX designs database had grown over 100x and was hitting peak CPU utilization during high traffic. Their software was just one overloaded database away from breaking real-time collaboration for millions of users. In this video, we're going to learn how they managed to solve this crisis. As with all things, Figma started with a single Postgres database. But unlike typical web apps, every design changes had to sync instantly across all collaborators. With millions of users making real-time edits, unpredictable latencies were breaking the core collaborative experience that made Figma valuable. Figma's infrastructure team knew that they needed a long-term solution that would reduce instability and scale for the future to come. But that would require extensive effort, which they couldn't afford right now. They just needed to buy themselves some time, and probably a lot of coffee. So they first upgraded their database to the largest instance available on AWS to maximize CPU utilization. They then created multiple read replicas to offload read queries from the primary database. And any new feature that were to be introduced will need to have a new database company. Finally, they added PG Bouncer a connection pooler that sits between the application and Postgres. Since each database connection consumes memory and has setup overhead, PG Bouncers allowed multiple application requests to share fewer actual database connections, preventing connection exhaustion and improving performance under high load. This fix did give them a bit of time, but it still had fundamental limitations. Data continues to grow nonstop, and their read replicas actually didn't do much. They analyzed their DB traffic and learned that write requests like creating, updating, or deleting data contributed to a significant portion of to their database utilization. This is likely due to the usage nature of Figma and their real-time collaboration. On top of that, not all reads could be moved to the replicas because some application features require immediate data consistency and cannot tolerate the delay between the primary database and read replica updates. After exploring many different options, they still needed a faster solution given their aggressive growth rate and only months of runway remaining. They started to look into partitioning by moving entire groups of related tables to dedicated databases rather than splitting individual tables across multiple DBs. The reason for this is to preserve atomic transactions while immediately relieving the original database and enabling future horizontal sharding. This reminds me of what my old tech lead used to say, things that are related should stay together. I miss that man. Anyways, to identify which tables to move, they look at two factors. Impact, the table should move significant workload. And isolation, the table shouldn't be strongly connected to other tables through joints or foreign keys. There were two options for the migration, logical and streaming replication. They actually decided to go with logical replication because it only copies specific tables from the original database to the new one. Streaming replication, on the other hand, would copy the entire database byte by byte, which would include all tables and would create a larger storage footprint. However, they discovered that logical replication was slow because Postgres inefficiently updates indexes one row at a time during the bulk copy, which would take forever if you're thinking about terabytes of production data. To solve this, they actually removed the index. They would only copy the data exactly as is, and then they would build the index afterwards. This alone reduced their copy time from days to just hours. Then they updated the application code to query from the migrated database. To de-risk the operation even further, they introduced a two-phase approach with PG Bouncer. First, they would create a separate PG Bouncer instance for different table groups, both initially pointing to the original database. This would allow the application to safely update their connection route. If anything were to go wrong, queries would still reach the correct database since the poolers access the same database. Only after confirming correct routing would they proceed with the actual database switch. This brought in significant change. Their largest partition only had CPU utilization hovering around only 10%, and it decreased the resources allocated to some of the lower traffic partitions. Things were good, right? Not exactly. You see, by late 2022, partitioning reached its limit once again. As individual tables grew to several terabytes with billions of rows, too large for a single database. Postgres vacuum operations caused reliability issues, 
and their highest write tables for approaching Amazon's RDS Max IOPS capacity. Horizontal scaling became the only option despite various problems that would come with it. Inefficient or impossible cross-chart queries, loss of atomic transactions between tables, complex coordination schema changes, and potential write failures across shards. However, Figma knew that it was time. They prepare for horizontal sharding by first, using logical sharding to test the waters before fully committing. They created multiple Postgres views per table that show filter subsets of the actual data based on conditions like user range IDs. When the application queries different shards, it's actually hitting these views on the same physical database. This lets them test sharding logic safely without actually moving any data. If something broke, they could easily just roll back with a simple configuration change. They then group related tables that share the same sharding key like user ID. A good shard key provides even data distribution and prevents hotspot on any single shard. This allows related data to be mapped to the same physical machine, therefore operations like transactions and join could still continue to exist. To further avoid hotspots from sequential IDs, they would hash the shard key before distributing. Suppose there's four shards and you have user ID 12345, you would hash that and then mod that by four to figure out which shard it belongs to. So these sequential user IDs will be scattered across different shards instead of clustering in one shard. They then built dbproxy, a Golang query engine that sits between the application and PG bouncers. It would examine an incoming query to identify which shard key is being used. If a query included the shard key like user ID, then it would route to the correct shard. If a query has none at all, it would send queries to all shards, collecting the result and combining them back. By the time they performed their first physical shard split, they were completely confident in the safety of their application code. In September 2023, they had successfully sharded their first table. The physical failover took only 10 seconds of a partial availability impact on primaries database with no availability impact on replicas. They saw no regression in latencies or availability after the migration. Most importantly, they proved that their approach worked. They can now horizontally shard the most complex high traffic tables that were hitting fundamental scaling limits. What are your thoughts of their implementations? Thank you so much for watching and see you in the next one.